स्मरामस्तेक भजाम तदेक जगत्साक्षिप नमाम सदेक निधान निरालंबमीशं भवाबोधिपोत शरण्यम व्रजाम ओ शांति 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 On that alone do we meditate that alone do we worship to that alone the witness of the universe do we bow to that one who is our soul eternal support the self-existent lord the raft to safety across the ocean of this world do we come for refuge om peace 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 good morning Good what, what a delight to be here after many months and we have the birds joining us and our topic is who me angry and uh, the idea behind this topic is that uh, over the uh, last few months there have been a few incidents that happened in my life that suddenly i found yeah me angry <laughs> i got i got very angry so i thought it's time to look again at anger uh so because it's a problem for i think pretty much all of us at times it can be a problem we get angry and what do we do with that energy how why do we get angry we we're, we're spiritual seekers we're not supposed to be angry right i'm spiritual so i don't get angry you know the great saints they don't get angry do they we so I'm a swami I should have mastered my anger by now so uh this kind of ideas <laughs> come up and it's surprising how quickly the anger arises and takes over without even uh any warning suddenly wow ready to shout ready to fight so uh what is all that about what what do we do what do we do about it Everybody experiences anger even animals get angry How, what do what can we do about it um we always do generally we do when we get really angry we do things and we say things which afterwards we regret but at the time of being angry we think it's the right thing to do and we'll talk more about why that happens so see krishna to discuss to that that very point um we th- we think we're perfectly justified in being angry and in throwing things and shouting and saying horrible things and all of that so it's very tricky um so one thing we can reflect on i like to remind myself how much suffering anger causes first of all when we are angry we are suffering we are not in a state of peace we're not in a state of equanimity we're suffering secondly how much suffering it causes to other people how much suffering how many murders are done in anger probably most of them how many people are beaten due to anger how many wars are fought because people got angry so it's a, obviously a, a a huge contributor to misery in this world and in our own lives it's a destroyer of life it's a gateway to hell you can say but it brings us into the hell of being angry and miserable and suffering and it's certainly a big obstacle in spiritual life when we are striving to attain equanimity we're striving to attain love for god we're striving to attain true joy we're striving to manifest the divinity within us in every word we speak in every act that we do and to see that same divinity shining in all people anger dest- destroys that so uh, the first task in dealing with anger and addressing anger is to convince ourselves that it's really an obstacle and that really we ought to we ought to be able to give it up we ought to work on giving it up on overcoming it on letting it go and that it is never justified 
that it, there's never a time when anger is actually justified. There's a nice quote from St. Francis de Sales. There was never an angry person that thought his anger unjust. When you're, we're angry, we think it's justified. Only afterwards we realize. Um, I, I like to remind us of the television program. It was a, a series when I was a kid called The Incredible Hulk. I don't know, those of you who are uh, maybe over 40 will remember it. Maybe it's, it's uh, younger ones have also seen it. But it was, like, now they've made big movies. But this was the old TV show. And this guy, his name was David Banner. He had, was a, it's kind of science fiction. He was trying to do some tests to unleash his inner strength. And the test went wrong. And so what ha would happen is when he became angry, he would uh, metamorphose into the Hulk, who, which was this huge, hulking, muscular, green, angry creature. Uh, and uh, of course, if you've seen it, it's, it's quite humorous now looking back on it. At the time, it was thrilling. As kids, we were thrilled by it. Now it's quite humorous and, and uh, it's a little bit uh, naive. But um, the hero, the, 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 uh, this David Banner, he would find himself, he was constantly in search of a cure. And he would find himself in various situations in which there would be bad guys. And the bad guys would provoke his anger. And then he'd say, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. And by that time, it's too late. He's already getting angry. <laughs> and then sh shortly thereafter, his eyes would turn green and his, his, the muscles would grow. And it was a different actor, Lou, Lou Ferrigno, one of the Mr. Universes, I think. Uh, he played the Hulk and just huge muscles. Uh, so, um, so then... What would the creature would do? He'd smash things. And he, of course, smash the, the bad guys and not without killing anyone, but smash them and s smash furniture and break through walls and create mayhem. Uh, and it was very satisfying. As, you know, the bad guys got smashed. You know, well, they got just, if he gets angry, then they'll get their lesson. <laughs> so they got some things right in the show. This idea that when we get angry, we lose all control. Like the Hulk, there's no control. We're just smashing through doors and wind and walls and throwing furniture, throwing people across the room in, into the wall, all those kind of things. Um, and uh, so we get this satisfaction. But um, what it doesn't get quite right is that the creature always did the right thing. It always, the, the creature always put the bad guys out of commission and save the damsel in distress. Usually it was a damsel in distress involved. And so he, the, the, the creature would always do the right thing. Whereas when we get angry, we almost never do the right thing. So uh, this kind of program reinforces the idea that anger can actually be a force for good. Hmm? See, the Hulk gets angry, David Banner gets angry, then he does the good thing, he does the right thing, he's able to stop the, the wickedness. And we resonate with this fantasy. I think it's deeply embedded in our culture, this, that anger gives us this tremendous power to do good, to stop the wicked and all of that. As if there were a few wicked people amongst us, and if we just crushed them and killed them and eliminated them, then everything would be fine. Actually, there's a little bit of wickedness in all of us, and of course, ultimately, pure divinity in all of us. So, uh, the producers of this show actually had the idea that every one of us has this creature within us. And uh, it seems like this creature is rearing his head a lot nowadays. When we look at the public f sphere and the, the political sphere and the public sphere, and you know, there's uh, road rage, and there's now rage outbursts on airplanes, and uh, at, at supermarkets, and at um, school board meetings, and everywhere people are just getting furious, and get, people are getting dragged out of meetings, they're so angry. They didn't transform into the Hulk, so they couldn't smash everybody in the meeting. But um, 
they probably would have wanted to. So rage seems to be getting normalized. That it's, that it's normal and that it's, it's a good thing. And it is not normal. So all this to remind us uh, that when we get angry, we're not helping ourselves, we're not helping the world. Spiritual traditions are unanimous in uh, guiding us on giving up anger, that anger is to be eschewed, is to be given up. For instance, Jesus is famous teaching, if you are offering something, you've brought a, a gift and offering to the altar, and you remember, uh, my brother or my sister is angry with me. Stop. Leave your gift there. Go and, and reconcile with your sibling. Go and reconcile everything. Then come back and make your offering. Don't, approach, don't even approach the altar with your offering until your affairs are settled with everybody. There's no one angry with you. Mm -hmm. So, do we agree? Is there no such thing? What about righteous indignation? Mm -hmm. What about injustice in the world? What about cruelty? Shouldn't we be angry about that? Doesn't anger pro give us the energy and the power to do something about these things? Swami Vivekananda, our founding monk, has this to say about it. He says, if you read the lives of the great workers which the world has produced, you will find that they were wonderfully calm persons. Nothing, as it were, could throw them off their balance. That is why the person who becomes angry never does a great amount of work. The person whom nothing can make angry accomplishes so much. The person who gives way to anger or hatred or any other passion cannot work. He or she only breaks himself to pieces and does nothing practical. It is the calm, forgiving, equable, well-balanced mind that does the greatest amount of work. So following this idea, we can understand that uh, when there is injustice, absolutely, we need to speak up, we need to address it, but not through anger. Anger dissipates our energy, actually. Though it seems like a great concentration of power, it actually breaks us apart. So anger is not helpful. Concern is helpful. Uh, resolving to address injustice, focusing our energies with compassion and with firmness is necessary, but not anger. So it... Uh, a good hint, though, that tremendous energy which comes when we get angry, that energy is within us. Can we learn to harness that energy and rather than express it through anger, which only breaks, express it through positive channels? So let's talk a little bit about what is anger exactly. We all know what, when we, all, we all know what it is, but what is it? It's like a, uh, a response, a reaction in our mind to some stimulus. There's a stimulus and a reaction comes. And there are, there are physical symptoms associated with it. And we, we know that it's a powerful and um, all-consuming uh, experience in our minds. And over time, it becomes a habit. As we repeat an, an experience, it becomes a habit. We get angry. Say, uh, um, you know, I've heard about uh, arguments in uh, families about whether to keep the toilet seat up or the toilet seat down, right? And so uh, the women like it down and the men like it up, and so the w women have been asking the men to keep it down and then come into the toilet, and again the seat is up. Angry, really angry. They, didn't, they don't respect me. They didn't. And uh, then the next time, even faster, oh, again, still angry. So this kind of habit gets stronger and stronger.
So, of course, there is a biological component. We feel it in our, in our bodies. And so we can feel like, well, it's natural. Everybody gets angry. It's natural. Uh, Vedanta calls upon us to transcend our biology. We have to transcend our biology, transcend these natural impulses which arise in our bodies and minds. Because Vedanta insists we are not bodies, though we think we are most of the time. We are not even minds, though we think we are most of the time. We are spirit of the very nature of consciousness and bliss. Can we manifest that? That is our calling. And habits, habits are just repeated actions. Habits can be changed. It's not as hard as we think. We think, oh, I'm just that way. Mm, it's just a habit. We can change a habit through uh, different thoughts which lead to different actions. I did a little research on the, the, the uh, psycho uh, Western psycho psychological analysis of anger. And we were talking about that this morning, that uh, psychologists in the Western tradition will say that anger is a secondary emotion. This is quite interesting. It's a secondary emotion generally covering or masking a primary emotion. And the main primary emotions could be fear, sadness, betrayal, loss of control, things like that. And so maybe we get angry because uh, the trash didn't get taken out. Uh, but what's, the, what's fueling it? A feeling of that I've been disrespected, maybe, because the, the person who I asked to take it out didn't take it out. Or um, maybe there's a sadness. Maybe there's some uh, unresolved conflicts in our lives that keep manifesting. That there's little things that happen now and this anger comes up and it seems all out of proportion. Why? Maybe we were, maybe one of our parents abandoned us as kids and we never really processed that, that grief and that anger that, that arises from that grief. And uh, so now when it, we feel like someone might be leaving us or abandoning us, tremendous anger comes. So this is from the um, psychological, psychotherapeutical standpoint, that yes, there is a real place in dealing with anger for psychotherapy or for talking things out with a good friend and remembering that uh, the past traumas that we had as kids and working, working those through and... and uh, mm -hmm addressing these unresolved conflicts which are sub now in our subconscious minds. And, uh, however, I want to focus a little more today on the Vedantic approach to dealing with anger. What does, what does Vedanta say? Um, I'd like to quote a little bit from Swami Vivekananda. He describes how anger completely takes over our mind. It's like a wave. It's like a wave that takes over the mind. A man says something very harsh to me, and I begin to feel that I am getting heated. And he goes on till I am perfectly angry and forget myself, identify myself with anger. When he first began to abuse me, I thought, I am going to be angry. Anger was one thing, and I was another. But when I became angry, I was anger. Like the, like the Hulk, right? The Incredible Hulk, the creature who first to Bill Bixby says, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me if I'm angry. So he's still, there's still some separation. And then he crosses a line and he becomes anger, as it were. Um, it's a very short gap between oftentimes a very short gap. So here's a, a little hint. Uh, as we develop the determination that, yes, I'm going to address anger. When we start to feel that anger coming up, we have to be mindful. Ah, there it is. We have to be able to recognize it before it completely takes over. Once it completely takes over our mind, it's too late. We're swept away. So as it's coming up, ah, there it is. And then there's, some, there's something we can do about it before it is totally taken over. Uh, the, Vivekananda goes on to say, these feelings have to be controlled in the germ, the root, 
in their fine forms, before we, even we have become conscious that they are acting on us. So, um, then again, he also says, he knows, it's not easy, it takes practice. He gives a nice, nice example. He says, it's very easy to talk. From my childhood, I have heard of seeing God everywhere and in everything. And then I can really enjoy the world. But as soon as I mix with the world and get a few blows from it, the idea vanishes. I'm walking in the street thinking of God, thinking that God is everywhere in every being that I meet. And somebody comes from behind and gives me a shove and I fall flat on my face on the sidewalk. Then I rise up quickly with clenched fist. The blood has rushed to my head and the reflection goes. Immediately, I have become mad. Everything is forgotten. Instead of encountering God, I see the devil. So this, this is the ordinary situation. It's not easy. But he says, well then, why bother all, with all of this? Why bother teaching this? Well, perseverance will conquer. Perseverance will conquer. So let us persevere. Now the Vedantic uh, analysis of anger in that we find in the Gita two approaches, the Bhagavad Gita, two approaches to understanding anger. And uh, one is anger is a result of frustrated desire or frustrated expectations. The second Anger is the result of a mind or a temperament steeped in uh, what we call in Vedanta rajas, this restlessness and activity, a sort of fruitless activity. Um, there's a beautiful pair of verses uh, in chapter 2, in which, uh, uh, let me ch chant the Sanskrit. Dhyayato vishayam pumsaha Sangaste shupa jayate Sangat sanjayate kamaha Kamat krodho vijayate Krodha bhavati sammohaha Sammohat smriti vibhramaha Smriti brahmshat buddhi nasho Buddhi nashat pranashyati Okay, thinking of, so this is Krishna instructing Arjuna in the psychology of uh, anger. Thinking of objects, attachment naturally develops for them. As we think of things, whatever we place our mind upon, attachment grows for those, those objects. From attachment grows desire. Now, Naturally proceeding from desire is anger. How? Because that uh, desire gets frustrated. Not all our desires can be fulfilled. Desires often are frustrated. Expectations get frustrated. They not, we don't, they're not met. So anger arises. And then he gives, this is the caution. From anger comes delusion. From delusion, we forget our, we forget what we know. We forget uh, our, our whole path of being calm and nice to people. <laughs> uh, from that forgetfulness, we lose our power of discernment. And losing our power of discernment, it leads to ruin. It leads to our ruin. So it's a good, a really great reminder. Um, on the one hand, it's, it's a great reminder of the harm of anger. Once anger takes over, Actually, we, we don't think, we cannot think properly, we cannot act properly. And how does it come? Sri Krishna traces it to our thoughts, what we think about. If we think of God, that desire for God naturally comes. If we think about how so-and-so insulted me six years ago, that... It's going to bring up some. It's going to bring up a different kind of a feeling. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about this, me, ourselves, not the true self that uh, Vedanta teaches who we really are. That true self, which is the peace that passeth understanding, the true self, which is 
infinite consciousness and bliss. The false, it's the false self that we try, we're constantly trying to prop up. We're thinking of it has this particular body, it has a particular form, and we want, it has desires and likes and dislikes and personality. And we spend a lot of time thinking of that and building it up. And when anything challenges that, what happens? Anger. It's the, the, desire for, the desire for the protection of this false me that gets challenged, that gets obstructed. And anger arises. Sri Krishna, a, a little later in the holy book, he, he describes uh, this state of, of uh, we can say, demonic people. And actually, there's not that there are demonic people and good people. We all have a little bit of the demon in us, and we all have, uh, I hope, a lot of the angel in us. And, uh, but he describes that in that state of negativity, he describes it as a hell, as an actual hell. And he says that the three are, the triple is the gate to this hell. Kama, Grodha, Lobha. Desire, craving, anger, and greed. And actually, they're all three interrelated. Uh, greed is, is actually just another kind of desire. Uh, 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 we can say karma, can we, we call, it, call it lust, and greed, and anger. And it's frustrated lust and greed which lead to anger. So he, he tells Arjuna, um, give these up. Go beyond this, this lust and greed and anger. Go beyond this. And he describes how such a person who gets angry like this, what, what do they think? This today has been gained by me. This desire I shall obtain. This is mine. And this wealth also shall be mine in the future. Thus deluded by ignorance, bewildered by many a fancy, covered by the meshes of delusion, addicted to the gratification of lust, they fall down into a foul hell. So here we see how this uh, is a pretty sobering analysis. Uh, the obstructed desires and expectations bring us to actually to hell. There's a saying, we are never angry for the reason we think. And I think it's a, it's, there's a lot of wisdom in there. We think we're angry because so-and-so said something to me. Actually, we're angry because we don't, have a, we don't have a very secure sense of self. We don't have a secure sense of self-esteem. So when somebody insulted me, I feel hurt and I feel uh, injured. And I, the anger is the response. If I can be more firm in my understanding of who I am, as a spark of light, a spark of divine light, as a, a reflection of divinity, then what does it matter what people say? It does, how can that touch me? I am not this body. I am, I am pure peace and joy. So, Who is it that we take to be ourselves? This is really one of the fundamental teachings of Vedanta, and it comes back again and again, because that's our project, to uh, re-image who we are from being bodies and minds. Yes, we have a mind. We're working through a body. We're working with a mind, and yet we are much more than that. And to touch that, and to discover that, and to find the peace and joy that lies in deep, deep within, within us. Uh, or we can say, to find God. It's a different way of saying the same thing. Yes, we can do it. We have the assurance of the saints and the sages that infinite peace is our birthright. And they are also pointing us out, look, look at these obstructions. Anger is an obstruction to that. Learn how to give it up. Learn how to transcend it. 
So to really uproot anger or to transcend it, to let it go, we have to uproot this craving lying deep in our minds to preserve and protect and bring enjoyment and honor to the false me, to the false me, by strengthening our understanding of who we really are. And the practice of meditation was a wonderful uh, adjunct to this. It's a, really, I would say, it's an essential part of this project of re-imaging ourselves, of understanding who we are, to practice meditation every day, twice a day if we can. Out of time. Hmm. Okay, let's um, turn to the second um, angle which the Gita suggests uh, is, uh, b- brings anger up, and that is f- in a person whose mind is steeped in this rajas. The, we need just a little bit of background. Most of you who are regular Vedanta students know that uh, Vedanta envisions this world as being made up of three different kinds of qualities. And one is called sattva. This is the principle of equanimity and peace. And one is called rajas, and that's the principle of activity and desire. And one is called tamas, and that's the principle of darkness and torpor and sleep. So we go from light and peace to activity and desire torpor, destruction, sleep, laziness. Uh, And for a spiritual seeker, we want to develop that first principle, that sattva, which is a principle of equanimity. uh, And anger, says Krishna, arises out of rajas, out of that uh, mind which is restless and active and desiring. So... um, Arjuna asks Krishna a really important question. He says, why do we do wicked things? Even though we don't really want to, why is it that we do such things? And Krishna tells him, well, yeah, it's, it's desire and anger. Desire and anger which prompt us to do that uncontrolled desire and anger which prompt us to do things which end up being harmful for us. Uh, so that's one way of understanding our minds as if we find a lot of anger arising, then we realize our anger, our, our minds are in this restless state. And what's the solution in that case? Calm the mind down. Slow down. Slow down. Swami Vivekananda saw in the 1890s that the, the Americans are, uh, are uh, he called it an indecent hurry. Everyone's rushing around. And that was 100 years ago. <laughs> what, what would he say today? Slow down. Slow down. In decent and brutal hurry, one of the qualities of a peaceful mind, a mind free from anger, and one of the most important qualities for us to cultivate here is patience. Patience. Slow down the mind. Can we slow the mind down? Pay a little attention to our breathing. Do a little mindfulness. Slow down. When that anger starts to arise, then we have the time to recognize it and to say, all right, all right, let it go. And now, here we come to finally another tool from the uh, science of meditation, which we call Raja Yoga. Um, How do we uh, deal with a wave of anger that comes? How do we deal with any wave that arises in our mind which is unhelpful? We rise, we raise an opposing wave in the mind. We raise an opposing wave. So Swami Vivekananda gives a great example. He says, think of love. Sometimes a mother is very angry with her husband. Okay, there's a, there's a domestic squabble going on. And while in that state, the baby comes in and she kisses the baby. The old wave dies out and a new wave arises. Love for the child. That suppresses the other one. Love is opposite to anger. So we find that by raising the opposite waves, we can conquer those which we want to reject. 
So this really is the science of, of overcoming anger, raising opposite waves, cultivating these waves of peace, of love, of patience, and strengthening them. And so we can call on them. When we feel that anger arising, call, call on the Lord. Call on our, that aspect of divinity which is closest to our heart. See if we can awaken love at that moment. It's difficult if we don't practice it. That's why we have to practice it regularly. Then when we're in the middle of the fire, ah yes, call it up. So Vivekananda says, it, it goes down to the subtle level. If we can raise in our fine nature those fine opposing waves, they will check the fine workings of anger beneath the conscious surface. So it's a question of practice, of regular practice, uh, conscious practice. Really, that's what the spiritual practice is all about, about retraining our minds and uh, recognizing the unhelpful tendencies and uh, changing them, counteracting them with positive tendencies. Okay, let's talk about a, a few little practical hints, uh, practical tips for um, uh, dealing with anger when it arises. Uh, one, compassion. Can we have compassion for a person who is making us angry? Maybe there's a person who is angry with us and we become angry in return. Can we have compassion instead? Recognize that there is some deep hurt in that person which is causing them to be angry or to act in the way they are or, or, or a, an ignorance or a, a, maybe a mental illness which is, uh, can we raise compassion for them? Compassion cancels the anger. Uh, the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, who, was, who recently left his body, he emphasizes very much, especially in families and among friends, to practice compassionate listening. And you can read more about it, what he says about it, but it's, it's beautiful how, how he describes how a family which is um, really torn with anger and people are not talking to each other, when they bring in this practice of compassionate listening, not, not fighting, not saying, well, but, but you're wrong, but just listening with compassion. And if what, even one person in a family can learn to do that, then everything starts to settle down. And gradually everybody learns how to do it. And then you can really, if you can listen with compassion, then you can uh, understand why someone feels hurt. Then the anger drops away, it melts away, and that underlying feeling, that primary emotion which caused the anger, that can be addressed and, and nurtured and healed. Of course, we, we watch our minds, we get to know the triggers, we get to know what particular things make us angry. That's what I learned in the, the, the past a month that are certain things that, that people do that make me angry and that, that, that thing hadn't happened for a long time so I didn't know but it was still there <laughs> it happened. So now I know, so now I'm, I'm resolved to be more careful the next time that particular thing happens. Uh, and this is a wonderful reminder, wait, wait before responding. I remember reading about uh, a man was uh, uh, r responding uh, w uh, with an email or maybe a tweet or something like that, uh, and uh, he was really fired up and he was really angry. Someone had insulted him and misunderstood and he's doing it, and suddenly he had to stop. Why? Not because he had a sudden insight of wisdom that, oh, I shouldn't be sending an email while I'm angry. We should never send an email while we're angry. Why did he have to stop? His fingers were trembling so much that he couldn't type the words. <laughs> he was so angry that his fingers were shaking. That's what happens if we get so angry. We're all... Oh, stop. Put down the phone. Put, put, put away the computer. Don't send an email when you're like that. You know, it used to be you write a letter and you're really angry and you write a long letter and you put it in the envelope and you put it on your desk to go out with the next morning's mail. And next morning, 
you've calmed down by then and you realize I can't send that letter, so you take it and you tear it up. But emails, it's very dangerous because as soon as you send it, it's gone and you, you can't recall it. So um, let's, let's take a, a resolve not to send an angry email. You can write it. If you have to write it, write it. And then keep it in the drafts folder. Just let it be. Let it wait till the next day. So you can you reread it. I, ha I have some really great, great emails in my drafts folder from several, from, the, from going back years. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's true. It, we get really creative and, and all of that. But I'm really glad I didn't send those. Really glad. All right, I'd like to take a little lesson here from uh, Epictetus, who was a, a Stoic from, who lived around the turn of the, right around, the, just after the time of Jesus, around the 50, year 50 to 135. And uh, it's amazing, these Stoics, Swami D has also spoken about the Stoics, uh, they really had a lot of wisdom. And here he gives this wonderful little lesson on anger. Whenever you are angry, be assured that it is not only a present evil, means right now it's bad, but that you have increased a habit and added fuel to a fire. If you would not be of an angry temper, then do not feed the habit. Give it nothing to help it increase. Be quiet at first, be quiet, and reckon the days, count the days in which you have not been angry. I used to be angry every day, now every other day, then every third and fourth day. And if you miss it so long as 30 days, offer a th sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. For habit is first weakened and then entirely destroyed. Quote, I was not vexed today, nor the next day, nor for three or four months after, but restrained myself under provocation. Be assured that you are in an excellent way. So the way we can work with our minds, we can make our minds our friend. This is, this is what he's really talking about. Making friends with our mind, cajoling our mind. Oh, come on, we, we, let it go, let it go. We can speak with our minds gently. And, okay, not today. Let's see if I can go another day without blowing my top. Hmm. Now, we may have a doubt. What about uh, great souls who get angry? What about that? We see his great souls get... Jesus came to the temple and he found money changers and he drove them all out with a big stick. So he did it. What about us? Be Jesus first. <laughs> uh, Sri Ramakrishna himself also says that sometimes he became angry. For instance, uh, uh, once he, he says, I engaged a carriage to bring me to, Cal to Calcutta and advanced the coachman three... Anas means uh, a few coins. Uh, but he didn't turn up. I became very angry with him. He is a very wicked man. See how much suffering he caused. So we see, even Sri Ramakrishna got angry about a little thing like this. All right, so some anger perhaps is inevitable. But what he would say, the anger in the mind of a holy person, of a spiritual person, is like a mark on water. He used to say it in, in rhymes. In Bengali, it's a rhyme. Sadhur rag, jolir dag. So the anger of someone who is devoted to God, who is, is on the spiritual path, is like a mark on water. How, it, it, you see it. You draw a line on water. You can see it for a, an instant, a brief instant, and then it's gone. So let our anger be like that. Interesting reminiscence of Swami Prabhavananda. When he first joined the monastery, Swami Prabhavananda is the founder of this center uh, and our, all our Southern California centers, except San Diego, it wasn't started yet then. Uh, he says, just after I had joined the, so just after he had joined the order at our main monastery, he was uh, present when Swami Premananda, one of the disciples of Ramakrishna and a very loving monk, he was scolding someone. He was uh, severely scolding another young monk. And Swami Prabhupada said to himself, Oh, this holy man loses his temper. And then he says, As soon as this thought crossed my mind,
Swami Premananda suddenly turned to me and smiled. Then, then he says, then he knew that his anger was not a real anger. It was a show. It was em, you, employed as a means to instruct the young novices. And so he says, from then on, he was never upset when uh, he was scolded by Swami Premananda. Rather, he felt this undercurrent of joy and considered those scoldings as blessings. There's another, another uh, incident in the life of Swami Vivekananda. They were in Mayavati, which is an a ashrama in the Himalayas, beautiful mountain peaks, and it's very, very remote. They had to travel on horseback for several days and all of that. And uh, one day dinner was late, and it was very late, and one of his disciples, a monk, was cooking dinner, and he was getting really irritated with everyone, Vivekananda, and he finally went to the kitchen to find out what's the deal and to scold the cook. And he, he found his disciple uh, working hard and blowing on the fire and smoke everywhere. And he's trying to get the fire burning. And so he, he didn't say anything, but uh, he, he backed off. And finally, the, the dinner was brought. And Swami Vivekananda said, take it away. I don't want it. <laughs> the disciple knew, knew his teacher quite well. So he just quietly brought the food and placed it before Vivekananda. And then like a child, he began to eat. And when he tasted the food, he was delighted. His anger disappeared. He praised the cooking and he ate well. And in the course of it, he said very endearingly, now I know why I was, got so angry. I was frightfully hungry. I was frightfully hungry. So maybe this is a, actually a very practical and simple lesson. Sometimes maybe we're, when we're angry, we need to go eat something. Go eat something. <laughs> All right. Last, last point I want to give, and this was a teaching of both Swami Vivekananda and his master, Sri Ramakrishna. He used to say, when we have these passions... There, what, what do we do with them? How do we get rid of them? Well, actually, you can't, don't get rid of them. Give them a Godward turn. If you have to be angry, be angry with God. Be angry with God. If things are not going as you want, rather than rage at different people, rage at God. You're thinking of God. And God is not like people that God's going to be angry at you if you're angry with God. <laughs> Our beloved, he'll never be angry with us. There's only love. God is love. So that anger gradually gets absorbed in that love. Swami Vivekananda puts it this way. If you want to be angry, be angry with him. Chide your beloved. Chide your friend. Whom else can you safely chide? Mortal man will not patiently put up with your anger. There will be a reaction. Say unto the beloved... Why do you not come to me? Why do you leave me thus alone? Let all our passions and emotions go up unto him. They are meant for him. And when they go straight to the mark, to the Lord, even the lowest of them becomes transfigured. This is a beautiful hint. Turn our passions to God and they become transfigured. So in sum, what we've talked about today um, first step in dealing with anger, convince ourselves that actually we, we want to deal with anger, that it's, that it's hurting us, that it's not something we want in our lives. That's the first step, and that's a really important, big first step. If that's real, if once we develop that conviction, I think the rest follows of itself. And then we look within, find the roots of anger. On the psychological side, the fear, Sadness, betrayal, low self-esteem, um, childhood traumas, perhaps. Then from the Vedantic standpoint, we start to look at that, that kind of craving we have, the lust we have, the greed we have, the expectations we have, the, the, the desperate attempts we are making to prop up this false me. And... Uh, Noticing those rajasic tendencies in our mind, those tendencies towards restlessness 
and we start undertaking spiritual disciplines to calm them down. We learn to change our response. We learn to raise an opposite wave of love when anger comes. We learn to withdraw, to wait, to be patient, don't send the email. We, pra we develop patience and compassion and forgiveness. We gain a higher sense of who we are. We become established in our spiritual identity. And if we must be angry, be angry with God. Turn it towards the divine. Let, it be, let our anger be like a mark on water. Let it pass away quickly. And as we can, re as we can uh, harness this tremendous energy which is being wasted through expressions of anger, we'll find uh, that energy is available to us for our spiritual seeking and for service. So this is what I wanted to share with you this morning. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. What, what do we do now? Do we have announcements? Q&A. Q&A. Anybody has a question or something came up and you'd like some clarification. Um, now's the time. Thank you so much. I enjoyed that. I had a question. When you spoke about Jesus getting angry at the temple, I had the same thought. I also thought about the First Testament in which the Jews were in Egypt suffering as slaves. And God came and he smite the, uh, with the plagues, right? Killing the firstborn child. Now, if we take that as truth, God was very angry. True, the Old Testament God is an angry God. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so here we have Jesus getting angry and what he did, and then we have God getting angry and what he did. And I guess for me, I always say, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. And that calms me. Mm -hmm. Because if we're all aspiring to a higher moral conviction, then by saying that, we know we have to give up the anger. And it may not come right away. It may even take days or weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But why does God uh, kill people? <laughs> okay, well, what, what I will say to this is, um, first, uh, as far as Jesus getting angry, was he really angry or was he making a show of anger? Right. And knowing who he was as a manifestation of the divine in human form, I would say that he's displaying anger. He's not angry the way we would be angry. He has to drive these people out. How are they going to go out? Um, so he makes a show, like, the, like Sri Ramakrishna's story of the, of the cobra, who uh, the teacher instructed the cobra not to bite anyone. And so the cobra finally was uh, injured, but people attacked it and, and injured it severely. And then the, the final teaching is, I told you not to bite anyone, but I didn't tell you not to hiss. I didn't tell you to Not to hiss, not oh. to hiss. So... Sometimes a little hissing is necessary. We just should be sure that we don't inject venom. A little hissing may, is, is definitely necessary in life. But uh, as far as, see, Swami Vivekananda has a beautiful talk on, on uh, the evolution of the concept of God. And as uh, uh, human, we human beings are evolving spiritually, our conception of God also evolves. So I would say that the conception of God as presented in the Old Testament is, is, uh, um, evolves from there to one in which it, we realize that the nature of the divine is pure love and it, God is not somebody sitting on a, on a cloud somewhere sending plagues down. It, it's, it's not just, <laughs> that's a, a somewhat immature conception of the divine. It's, we, we, Swami Vivekananda always would say, we go not from error to truth, but from lower truth to higher truth. So it's not that uh, it's wrong to think of God in that way. We develop our conception. He would say uh, if a, 
a fish uh, had God, a fish would imagine a giant fish, you know, an all-powerful fish. And if a cow has a God, it would be an all-powerful cow. So we, um, we envision the divine as being something like us, but greater. Actually, the divine is beyond all conceptions that we could possibly have. But uh, so as we g- grow spiritually, we begin to realize, oh, the, the possibilities of the divine. Our possibilities are tremendous. I've seen people who don't have no hatred. Well, God must be like that. No anger, no hatred. No, thanks for your, for your comment. Om asatoma sadgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya mrityor mamritangamaya Om Shanti 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 From the unreal, lead us to the real. From darkness, lead us unto light. From death, lead us to immortality. Om 